So now, as we continue on post-operative complications, and by the way, as I told you in the very beginning of this lecture, if you are the surgeon or you are taking care of that surgical patient, it is your responsibility to evaluate that patient post-operatively. You do not delegate that responsibility to someone else. You do it yourself. It's very important for you to be very diligent and conscientious. So now, I want to ask you a test question and a life question. Can you get a myocardial infarction, heart attack, in the operating room? You bet you can. So the test question and the life question will be, what is the most common reason in the operating room that you can get a myocardial infarction? By far, it is one thing, hypotension, hypotension. That is why anesthesiologists go nuts when the patient is hypotensive. And so that is the most common reason for an intraoperative myocardial infarction. And how can you tell? Well, postoperatively, you measure what? Troponin. And you get EKGs. Does it happen? Yes. Do you try to avoid it? Yes. So you don't like hypotension. All right? Very, very important. And it happens. It happens. Next. Postoperatively, the patient gets short of breath. Now, you could think there's a lot of causes of shortness of breath. They could go into heart failure. Uh, just a whole lot of reasons. But the one thing you have to think about is pulmonary embolus. Guys, it can occur anytime, even if a patient is prophylaxed mechanically in chemoprophylaxis. Is it common when you have good prophylaxis? No. Does it happen? Yes. And you have to be, what's that word? Safety. You have to be safe. You have to think about it. So therefore, if there is any question at all about shortness of breath postoperatively, you immediately get a CT scan of the chest. You do not delay. You do not wait till the morning. You get it straight away. And in fact, the nurse will call you up and they will say, the patient is short of breath. I increased their oxygen to 100%. And I've already preliminarily getting set for the CT scan of the chest. Is that okay with you, doctor? They know they will get all set for that CT scan of the chest. Again, you do not wait. You do not wait because a pulmonary embolus, and I'm sure you've seen this, can be fatal, okay? Very, very, very important. And if you indeed have a pulmonary embolus, you have to treat that patient with systemic heparin or other agents because that patient could die. And it happens. Now, I want to tell you something that it happens much less than it used to. And I will tell you, when I was in my early years of practice, when we didn't have routine sequential compression devices or things like that, I mean, we put Ted hose on people. There were a lot of patients where they would get up from surgery after a couple of days, walk around the hospital and they would have a pulmonary embolus. And in those days, we didn't always get CAT scans. We did things called VQ scans, which you don't need to know about for pulmonary embolus because we don't do that anymore. 
And it, we really didn't do a great job of dealing with patients with pulmonary embolus. Why do I go into this so strongly? Because it's really important and it could kill someone. It could kill someone. So again, you have to be safe. And if there's any question, if you're on the fence and you're thinking, well, the patient's a little short of breath, uh, well, you have to be safe. You have to be safe. It's better to stay out of trouble than to get out of trouble so you get that CT scan. But what about another complication that can occur? One of the things that we're gonna talk about is aspiration. Good or bad thing? Bad thing. Aspiration is awful. Meaning someone vomits and breathes it in. And you know, now I know a lot of you are young, but if you grew up in the 60s and 70s, especially with the rock and roll stars, a lot of them died because of drug overdoses and they vomited and aspirated. It was very common. I presume that hopefully it's, it's less common now, but aspiration pneumonia is very, very bad. Okay, so now let's talk about aspiration pneumonia. That's why anesthesiologists when they intubate the patient, they, they protect that patient's airway. They make sure that patient hasn't eaten or had anything to drink for uh, eight hours. Those are all things that to prevent aspiration. Does it still occur? Yes. So I'm gonna ask you a question. Basically, there are three treatments of aspiration pneumonia, basically three treatments. Number one, bronchoscopy, lavage, cleaning it out. Number two, intravenous antibiotics. And number three, and not everyone agrees with number three, but steroids. A lot of people will use steroids. I happen to like them. They're not going to ask you this on your test because it's controversial, but the three basic things bronchoscopy, lavage, antibiotics, and steroids. So let me ask you a test question and life question, okay? You do all of these straight away, but if you had to say which one is the most important, which is the most important, bronchoscopy, lavage, by far, by far, bronchoscopy and lavage, why? you get some of that gastric contents that goes into your bronchioles, you won't be able to get it out. You will get a necrotizing, a necrotizing pneumonia. You will get a necrotizing pneumonia. So you will see an anesthesiologist immediately, if they have an aspiration, they will start lavaging. What that means is they'll be pouring um, water down, cleaning, trying to get out all of that stuff that got aspirated. So bronchoscopy, even though the other things are also done simultaneously, oh, bronchoscopy is the most important thing. Now, one of the pulmonary complications, which I have a patient now, who has this is called ARDS, Adult Respiratory Distress Syndrome. And I'm sure you have seen patients with this. And this is a very, very bad clinical situation. It's commonly caused by sepsis or trauma, and they commonly are in multi-system organ failure and you get a chest x-ray and it looks like a snowstorm. It looks like a snowstorm in the chest x-ray. And how clinically, test question, can you tell clinically? Generally speaking, it's when they get decreasing PO2 in the face of increasing FiO2. Let me say that again. Decreasing PO2 
in the face of increasing FiO2, meaning the nurse calls you up and says, doctor, the, the, the uh, uh, saturation of this patient, the oxygen saturation is going down. And you say, well, let's increase the O2. And they call you back and they say, well, it's not working. And you say, okay, let's increase the O2 more. And their arterial saturation goes down. That's the clinical expression of ARDS. And how do you treat ARDS? Of course, they're intubated and you do PEEP, positive pressure. So you say, well, why do you do positive pressure? Remember that the pathogenesis of ARDS has to do with the surfactant, which maintains the surface tension of the alveoli. And if you have a problem with the surfactant, which you do in ARDS, the alveoli close. And that's why you need positive pressure. So the treatment of ARDS, in addition to many other things, is primarily positive pressure. So let's talk about another, another pulmonary problem that can occur postoperatively. All right. Let's say you've got a trauma patient. And that patient has, let's say, rib fractures and gunshot wounds to the chest. And all of a sudden, you're operating on their belly. And the patient develops a tension pneumothorax. Is that good or bad? That's bad. A collapsed lung in of itself is not that bad, but it's terrible if it's a tension pneumothorax. Why? And we'll go into this in one of our later lectures. Remember the mediastinum shifts. And all of a sudden, that patient becomes hypotensive and that patient could die. Well, you have to deal with that tension pneumothorax straight away. Now, you will read, and someone might even tell you that you can stick a needle through the diaphragm and you can decompress the tension pneumothorax and turn it into a regular pneumothorax. But that's not very good because you can contaminate the pleural cavity. The ideal approach, test question and life question, is to, as you learned, place a needle in the second intercostal space and that decompresses the lung from a tension pneumothorax to a simple pneumothorax. Mm -hmm. Do you need a chest tube once you've completed your operation? Yeah, but you'll be able to get through the surgery and the anesthesiologist will be able to get through it without a significant problem. Now, here's the most important point. This isn't on your test. This is a life lesson. Not every anesthesiologist is comfortable putting a needle in the second intercostal space. So what you do, if you're operating, you be a gentleman and a gentlewoman, and you ask the anesthesiologist, would you like some assistance? And many times they will say, yes, thank you. And what happens is you walk around to the top of the table, meaning where the anesthesiologist is, and you either do it or help the anesthesiologist. Then you re-scrub and re-gown and go back to the operating room. The point is, and this is a life lesson, don't be an idiot. Meaning, don't yell at the anesthesiologist and say, come on, put in a, a needle in that second intercostal space. Be a gentleman and a gentlewoman and ask, would you like some assistance? Because many times, the anesthesiologist will say, I would greatly appreciate it. And always be helpful. All right. And that happens, attention pneumothorax intraoperatively. So it, it's, it's not something that is rarely seen. It's not common, but it is seen. All right.